welcome to Maulana Azad National Urdu University's Global Classroom. Today's lesson is meant for the students enrolled in the first year MA English program through the distance mode. However, the students of the on-campus mode will also find the next 30 minutes an enriching experience. Today's, the title of today's lesson, Character of Heathcliff is from Block 3, Unit 3 of Paper 3 and is based on the novel Wuthering Heights written by Emily Brandt. On the screen before you is the picture of the famous 19th century novelist. In the next few minutes, we shall attempt a character sketch of Heathcliff, the central character in the novel Wuthering Heights, which as you may remember was published in 1847. What you are looking at now is the title cover page of the Penguin edition of Wuthering Heights. The novel takes its title from the name of the building in which the central character Heathcliff is brought in and raised by Mr. Earnshaw along with his two children Hindley and Catherine. That is Wuthering Heights for you. Our discussion today as I told you at the beginning will revolve round the character of Heathcliff. Heathcliff as you are aware is a vagabond who was found by Mr. Earnshaw in Liverpool and brought up by him and raised along with his children. In the course of the novel Heathcliff falls in love with Catherine Earnshaw. Though Mr. Earnshaw was optimistic of bringing up Heathcliff along with his own children and even told his wife, you must even take it as a gift of God, though it's as if it came from the devil. The family never considers Heathcliff as a gift of God. Instead, he is considered a usurper. Nelly Dean comments that Hindley considered Heathcliff as a usurper of his parents' affections and his privileges. Nelly Dean, if you remember, is the housekeeper first of Mr. Ranshaw and later of Mr. Linton. She is the confidant of Catherine and the guardian of Catherine Jr. Before we proceed any further, I would like to ask you some questions. Have you read the novel Wuthering Heights? Have you read Unit 3 of Block 3 from the paper British novel? If you have not read the text, you will find it very difficult to follow the lesson today. You will not be in a position to understand the plot or realize the relationship between the different characters. To help you, in case you have not read the novel, I will quickly tell you in brief about the different characters and the story outline. Those of you who have already read the novel will find the text uh, more interesting henceforth. There are two principal families around whom the plot revolves. One is the Earnshaw family and the other is the Linton family. Let us first look at the Earnshaw family which lives in Wuthering Heights. Mr. and Mrs. Earnshaw have two children, Hindley and Catherine. He has two hands to help him out, Nellie Dean who acts as the narrator for most part of the novel and Joseph. He later brings in Heathcliff and brings him up. Heathcliff in the course of the novel gets married to Isabella who is the sister of Linton whom Catherine eventually marries. Hindley has a son Hareton and Catherine and, and Edgar have a daughter who we shall refer to as Catherine Jr. Now in the Linton family we have Mr. and Mrs. Linton with their two children Edgar and Isabella. Catherine later marries Edgar but she continues to love Heathcliff. Isabella falls in love with Heathcliff, elopes with him, has a son whom she prefers to name Linton. The daughter born to Edgar and Catherine is Catherine Jr. or Cathy. Going back to a discussion of Heathcliff as a usurper and why should it not be thus? After Heathcliff's arrival, the family tree began to look something like this. You have Mr. Heath, Mr. Earnshaw and his two children, Hindley and Catherine. But after the arrival of Heathcliff, he supersedes Hindley and Catherine 
in the affections of Mr. Earnshaw. Now Heathcliff is not always projected as a negative character. In fact, the story first opens with Mr. Lockwood, who is the narrator, an outsider who evinces keen interest in the characters, describing Heathcliff in complimentary terms as you can see. He is a dark-skinned gypsy in aspect, in dress and manners a gentleman. He is an erect and handsome figure. That Heathcliff is dark-skinned is also revealed to the readers when he is first introduced in the household. The darkness does not only bring up associations of evil, sin, ignorance in the religious terms, but also signifies mystery, awe, passion and warmth of emotions associated with the East in the 19th century. In the course of the novel, Heathcliff evokes all of these. Now, let us look at what, at what Nellie Dean has to say about Heathcliff. In his childhood, Nellie Dean says, Heathcliff was as uncomplaining as a lamb, though hardness, not gentleness, made him give little trouble. Later, with the passage of time, Heathcliff grew up to be rough as a saw edge and hard as windstone. It must be remembered here that Heathcliff had a difficult childhood. As long as Mr. Earnshaw was alive, he was sheltered and protected, but Hindley and Joseph always found ways of abusing and harassing Heathcliff. He did receive love from Catherine, but she was not always gentle with him. Moreover, after meeting Edgar, the fair aristocratic weakling who later marries Catherine, Heathcliff has a desire to reform and becomes wishful. This is what he tells Nelly Dean. Nelly, make me decent. I'm going to be good. And he continues, I wish I had light hair and a fair skin and was dressed and behaved as well and had a chance of being rich as he will be. This conveys to us the message that Heathcliff, in spite of his tough exterior, is softer and nurtures a desire to improve himself. But remember, Heathcliff is ready for this reform only because he fears he may lose Catherine to Edgar. In mending himself, he hopes to be like Edgar, with light hair and fair skin, only to secure Catherine. This, this takes us to another quality of Heathcliff. He is obsessed with Catherine. His obsession with Catherine is evident at several places in the novel. In fact, it is his obsessive love for Catherine that makes Wuthering Heights a very powerful novel. To give a few examples, look at these. Two words would comprehend my future, death and hell. Existence after losing her would be hell. This is what Heathcliff says about life without uh, Catherine. And after Catherine's death, Heathcliff raves, be with me always, take any form, drive me mad, only do not leave me in this abyss where I cannot find you. I cannot live without my life, I cannot live without my soul. Even at the beginning of the plot, when the readers are not yet fully aware of all the characters and know nothing about the relationship between Catherine and Heathcliff, we are introduced to the emotional side of Heathcliff, which also displays how intensely passionate is his love for her. Calling up her ghost, Come and come and he sobbed. Cathy, do come, oh do, once more. Oh my heart, darling, hear me this time. Catherine, at last. This is almost unimaginable. One lover calling up his dead beloved and imploring her to step in and to listen to his pleas? Doesn't it send a chill down your spine? But you know that is how Heathcliff is, very, very possessive. He even digs up her grave to be with her and arranges to be buried next to her. But Catherine is not the only one about whom he is possessive. He is also possessive about his son Linton, born to Edgar's sister, as also about Hareton, Hindley's son. Look at what he has to say soon after Hindley's death when Hareton is left in his possession. Now, my bonny lad, you are mine. And we'll see if one tree won't grow as crooked as another with the same wind to twist it. 
Heathcliff, you know, is not just possessive, but is also vengeful. He seeks revenge on everyone who was responsible for creating hurdles in his path to gaining Catherine's love. It must, however, be remembered that Heathcliff's ferocity or his vengefulness comes to the fore only after he loses Catherine to Edgar. He seeks vengeance against Hindley and destroys him both financially and physically. He forcibly gets Catherine Jr. married to his son. He is responsible for causing Edgar's death by the forceful confinement of his daughter and allowing him to believe that she was lost forever in the marshy ground. He is revengeful toward his wife because she is the sister of Edgar, who, as you know, married Catherine. He does not even spare his own son. Look at a few examples which show his vengefulness. If I might have the privilege of flinging Joseph off the highest gable and painting the house front with Hindley's blood, I vociferated curses enough to annihilate any fiend in Christendom. I got a stone and thrust it between his jaws. Nellie Dean says, I really thought him not vindictive. I was deceived. So you see, Heathcliff is full of vengeance. His vengeance also makes him ruthless. He is ruthless against Catherine Jr. His treatment of his son, even when he is dying, is abominable. He treats Hareton shabbily and displays no mercy toward anyone. His ruthlessness is so vicious that his wife implores in a letter to Nellie Dean. I beseech you to explain, if you can, what I have married, indicating that Heathcliff may not even be a human. One character in the novel who judges him more judiciously precisely because of their proximity and love for each other is Catherine. In her opinion, Heathcliff is an unreclaimed creature without refinement, without cultivation, an arid wilderness of firs and windstone. He is not a rough diamond, a pearl containing oyster for rustic. He is a fierce, pitiless, wolfish man. Everest is growing with him a besetting sin. Nobody likes Heathcliff. Nellie Dean has no soft corner for him, though at times she does feel pity for him. Hinley, Edgar, Joseph and others hate him. So we can say that Heathcliff is loathsome. Heathcliff is loathsome because he leads an embittered life. In spite of the efforts of Nellie Dean and Catherine herself, he cannot overcome his sense of inferiority. He feels extremely embittered, both when Catherine decides to forsake him and marry Edgar, and also on her death. His sense of embitterment makes him wild. He is like an unbridled horse and a provoked bull. He does not spare anyone. He is unforgiving and leads a solitary life. His sense of isolation is self-imposed. He cuts himself off from society. He avoids visitors and does not even welcome his own tenant, Mr. Lockwood at Wuthering Heights. His mission remains to subvert the plans of Hindley and Edgar or even of Nellie Dean and Catherine Jr. He prevents Hindley from claiming his mortgage property. He subverts the attempts of his daughter-in-law in teaching Hareton to read. He foils the attempts of Nellie to escape with Catherine from his forced confinement. He does not give Edgar a chance of bringing up his son. The list goes on to prove that Heathcliff is subversive. This makes a number of critics feel that Heathcliff does not conform to the rules of society. He is a non-conformist who believes in living life on his own terms. Conventions and Heathcliff are poles apart. So we can comfortably say that Heathcliff is a rebel. Heathcliff's rebelliousness makes us doubt if he can be considered the hero of Wuthering Heights. He is definitely the central character and keeps the plot woven together but heroic qualities seem alien to Heathcliff, then, at best, he may be termed an anti-hero. Another way of considering Heathcliff's character is to associate him with the building Wuthering Heights, 
Do you know? Wuthering is descriptive of the atmospheric tumult to which its station is exposed in stormy weather. So, like the building, Heathcliff has to bear the tumult to which is exposed in a stormy life. Nelly Dean ironically says that, I could have told Heathcliff's story, all that you need here, in half a dozen words. But we have been talking for so long and we are not yet done with Heathcliff's character. His life is powerful and makes us feel sympathetic, in spite of all the negative traits in his character. The love triangle or the vicious circle, if you so wish to term, can be represented thus. Heathcliff loves Catherine. Catherine also loves Heathcliff, but she gets married to Edgar and Edgar hates Heathcliff. Or you may represent the love, love of Catherine and Isabella for Heathcliff thus. And where does it take us? Our understanding of Heathcliff is a continual process. From the beginning of the novel to the end, we are in the process of learning about Heathcliff. He continues to retain the sympathy of the readers. He emerges a victim of circumstances. His transformation into a gentleman in outward aspect and a cruel being internally results after a shocking revelation. He overhears part of the conversation between Catherine and Nelly. I would like you to listen to me as I read out passages from this conversation. Listen carefully for you will not only learn the reason for the turning point in Heathcliff's character but also understand why Catherine chose to marry Edgar when she loved Heathcliff. Listen to me as I read out. Catherine, in conversation with Nellie Dean, tells her, It would degrade me to marry Heathcliff now, so he shall never know how I love him. And that not because he's handsome, Nellie, but because he's more myself than I am. Whatever our souls are made of, his and mine are the same. And Linton's is as different as a moonbeam from lightning or frost from fire. And when Nellie Dean comments how she will bear the separation, Catherine blurts out, He quite deserted, we separated. Who is to separate us, pray? Every Linton on the face of the earth might melt into nothing before I could consent to forsake Heathcliff. Oh, that's not what I intend, that's not what I mean. I shouldn't be Mrs. Linton were such a price demanded. He will be as much to me as he has been all his lifetime. Edgar must shake off his antipathy and tolerate him at least. He will when he learns my true feelings towards him. Nelly, I see now you think me a selfish wretch, but did it never strike you that if Heathcliff and I married, we should be beggars? Whereas if I marry Linton, I can aid Heathcliff to rise and place him out of my brother's power. Now Nelidin is surprised. She finds it very difficult to understand Catherine's logic. She questions her. With your husband's money, Miss Catherine? I asked. You'll find him not so pliable as you calculate upon. And though I am hardly a judge, I think that's the worst motive you have given yet for being the wife of young Linton. It is not, retorted she, it is the best. This is Catherine speaking with vehemence. A little later, she asserts, Nelly, I am Heathcliff. He is always, always in my mind, not as a pleasure any more than I am al always a pleasure to myself, but as my own being. So don't talk of a separation again. It is impractical. So you see the kind of feelings that Catherine has for Heathcliff. After reading this passage, don't you think we have to reassess the character of Heathcliff? Is there something in Heathcliff that appeals to Catherine that could also appeal to the other characters or to the readers? If you remember, after the death of Heathcliff, the only character who mourns his loss is Hareton, Hindley's son, whom Heathcliff had intentionally brought, brought up very, very shabbily. But if Hareton can care for Heathcliff, if Hareton can mourn Heathcliff's death, isn't there something that we have to ponder about? 
I have already told you about the turning point in Heathcliff's, in Heathcliff's life. Before that, he was fine. He would be abused and he wouldn't retaliate. He would still find ways and means of overcoming both Hindley as well as Joseph. He could even tolerate the Linton family. But then, with what he overhears Catherine telling, especially when she says, it would degrade me to marry Heathcliff. Heathcliff loses all heart. The one woman for whom he could do anything in the world was not prepared for marriage with him. And so Heathcliff leaves, goes away for some years and returns a gentleman. Outwardly, yes. And Edgar, Catherine's husband, knows very well that Heathcliff has not actually transformed He's still full of revenge. He's still full of hatred for those who took away Catherine from his life. So, if we have to understand the character of Heathcliff, there are many, many issues in the novel that we have to ponder on. Unless you actually read the novel, you will find that understanding the character of Heathcliff would be difficult. But remember, do not judge him in isolation. He leads a solitary life. He is by himself. There is nobody who can understand his feelings. There is nobody who shows care or concern for him. Towards the later part of the novel, when uh, the junior Catherine stays with him, Heathcliff does not have any peaceful life. Cathy, of course, also suffers. But what about Heathcliff? He pines for his lost love and he yearns, hoping that he will eventually be united with Catherine, if not now, at least after death. And his idea of heaven, if you remember, is to be one with Catherine in death. In all these respects, Heathcliff does emerge as the most powerful character in the novel. Now, after this discussion, I'm sure if you have until now not read Wuthering Heights, you will at least now go to the text, read it thoroughly, not once, but more than once in order to see what a great novel Emily Bront has written. And while you're reading it, reconsider the character of Heathcliff. And when you go to your study center, feel free to converse with the counselor, of, counselor in English about not just the novel, the different characters, the narrative technique, the plot, but also, of course, the character of Heathcliff. If you have any suggestions, views, you may write to us at the following address. The Director, Directorate of Distance Education, Maulana Azad National Urdu University, Gachibauli, 500032. Until then, this is Dr. Gulfishan Habib, Reader in English, signing off. Goodbye and take care. Mm -hmm.